As the words of wisdom go, music is a universal language and recent years Korea has been seeing a growing number of foreign practitioners of traditional Korean sounds. So how did these foreign musicians first encounter Korea's pansori and samulnuri? What do they say is the appeal of these traditional sounds? And how should Korea seek to better preserve its traditional music? Welcome to Issues and Insiders. Today, we share with you the thoughts of two practitioners of traditional Korean music who hope to keep these sounds resonating beyond borders. For more, I have Anna Yeetsu, an assistant professor at, in the department, that is, of Korean music at Seoul National University, who has graciously allowed me to address her with her first name. Anna, it's a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. I also have Kaya Brusasko, team leader of Expert Samul Nori, who is also here with us. It's a pleasure to have you as well, Kaya. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. Right. Anna, we'll start with you then. Could you perhaps tell us a bit about your path to Pansori? Well, so I first encountered Pansori while I was doing my master's in cultural policy. Um, and it was just, you know, you hear in the class, oh, there's this thing, look, here's an audio recording. And at the time, I wasn't that interested, but there was a concert being held at the Korean Cultural Center in London. And I was like, well, you know, why not just go and see? And I was fascinated. The way that they could express so many things with just their voice in a fan um, was just so interesting for me. Then I got curious and then decided that maybe cultural policy wasn't my area and I'd much rather be researching pansori. So I then switched my major and started PhD research on Pansuri in 2013 and have been kind of continuing to walk the path ever since. Right, I see. <laughs> and, and Kaya, what spurred your interest in uh, Samul Nori? Um, well, I first encountered Samul Nori in America. I took a class that was entitled The History of Korean Music. So it went from very ancient and traditional music all the way through to modern pop songs. And luckily, as part of that class, we had a few guest performances and guest lectures. And two students from a university Samunori club came to our class with instruments and gave us a little taste of their music. And I thought it was just really fascinating, really cool. And from that moment, I was hooked. And so, What instrument do you play? I have played all of the four Samunori instruments, but my main instruments are Changu, which is the hourglass drum, and Gwengari, which is the small metal noisiest gong. <laughs> yeah. Right, I see. And before we delve any further, Pan, uh, Anna, for the sake of our viewers who may not be familiar with Pansori, could you tell us a bit about it and also about its particular appeal for you personally? Okay, so normally uh, when I define pansori, I say it's storytelling through songs. So you've got, um, they're very well-known folk tales. Um, some of them uh, can go up to eight hours long. Um, and so it's incredibly rich and detailed. Um, obviously, the singer isn't singing the whole time while they're doing it. They'll alternate singing and narration. There's also a dramatic gesture that goes in as well. So it's a really exciting genre where the audience participates a lot as well. And I mean, I said just now that the just the way the range of expression of sound um, is fascinating. I mean, you're providing all your own sound effects with your own voice. Uh, but even more, when you look at just the sort of the length of the stories, obviously there's so much rich detail, really engaging stories. And I think the further I go in Pansori, the more it's that aspect that really attracts me a lot more as well. Right. Um, this is an impromptu question. Anna, when you first encountered Pansori over in London, mm -hmm. were you, did you know Korean language or did you learn the language afterwards? Well, I'd learnt some, um, but nowhere near at the level that I could understand the text just right off the bat. Um, in fact, though, there were subtitles at the time. That's quite common when you go overseas. You'll have like subtitled pansori performances. I didn't watch them because the, um, the action itself was so dynamic. I was watching a battle scene between two boats on a river, and you could tell that just from the singing, from the way she was moving her fan, you could tell that even without actually understanding all the words. So essentially it's like music has a universal language as the saying goes then? Well yes, simply <laughs> put yes. <laughs> Likewise Kaya, could you tell us a bit about Samul Nori and its appeal for you? Yes, so Samul Nori was developed in the 1970s and it came from the traditional Pungmul Nori or some Nongak that was usually performed outside as a parade. So the performers carried their instruments and they usually walked quite a long distance around the town or between villages. And 
they would continue playing for hours on end and as part of this festive and celebration. So those rhythms from various regions in Korea were combined and a little bit shortened or heightened for an indoor stage presentation. So Samonori is using four different instruments and for me personally, I think the rhythms are most appealing and attractive. Uh, I was very familiar with music based on three beats or four beats, but in the Samonori rhythms there are five beats and six beats and the combinations are quite unique. So the whole sound and the rhythm, rhythmic structure was very attractive to me. Right, I see. And now, Anna, let's talk a little bit about the learning process itself. Were there any particular hardships in trying to uh, master or learn, that is, pansori as a foreigner, would you say? Well, I mean, I think in general, when you talk about learning pansori, it's very often framed in terms of hardship. You're supposed to go into the mountains, spit blood and this kind of thing. But that's common to all pansori learners. If you hear the stories, the lives of some of the master singers, they really already had to put a lot of work in themselves. So I'm not sure how unique the foreign experience of learning pansori is. Perhaps we focus a bit more on pronunciation. I think maybe that's one aspect that doesn't come so naturally. But otherwise, you know, when you're starting with looking at a pansuri beginner they don't often know what the words mean they don't know how to use their voices like that either so it's just more a thing of I'm starting about 20 years 25 years behind a, a pansuri singer who's the same age as me so I've just got a lot of catching up to do mainly right I said how's that experience been the catching up well, I mean, it's... I mean, did you venture to a mountain? And yeah, oh, yes, yes. Um, if I can, I try and go twice a year, in winter and in summer. Um, the whole bleeding from the throat thing is, if you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. Uh, but you do go hoarse, and you're trying to sort of train up your muscles to sing. So you sing until you go hoarse, and then you force it out with your belly, and then your belly starts hurting, and then you force it with your back, and your back starts hurting, and so on. So it's painful. But it's a pain, pain that is in common with any pansuri learner, rather than specific to a foreign. Right, I see. Uh, Gaia, do tell us a bit about your learning experience. Oh, uh, well, luckily, I think that Samonari does not have quite the hardships that Pansori singers must endure. Um, my learning experience was very fun and positive. I think the biggest challenge was finding classes or groups to practice with. Um, I started learning Samonori really seriously in Korea, so so your interest began in the U.S. and you came to Korea to learn the instruments then? I, when I knew that I was going to come to Korea, I had already researched about what class I could join and the Kukakwan was offering a class for foreign residents, just an introduction to Changgu. So I already knew about that class and I wanted to start ASAP. I had that plan to start. And after that, I really enjoyed the learning and I think one aspect that's very appealing is the social aspect because unlike piano where you could have a solo, Samonori needs other people. So you have to play with a team or a group. It's possible to practice on your own, but especially for the performance, you need some group connection to really feel the music and play together. So all of my experiences have been great because I've been able to meet both foreign friends and Korean friends and really enjoy that social aspect of the music as well. Right. In your opinion, how long do you suppose do you need to play panso, uh, do you need to play Samul Nori in order to perhaps put on a performance that the audience would appreciate? Well, it's, it's a little bit difficult to say because I feel like as a foreign performer, there's a little bit of understanding from the audience, especially a Korean audience will think that, oh, she's so passionate and she's so enthusiastic that makes up for some like the fact that I'm not as technically advanced or skilled as other players but I think because Samonori comes from those Pungmul roots then Pungmul really if you're playing for hours on end you can just follow the parade and follow the performer in front of you and if you are unsure about a rhythm you could just watch what are the other people doing and just join in and it's very communal and fun so I really think you can enjoy performing and have a very fun and energetic performance even after just a few months. But of course, when I look at my own performance videos 
as a beginner, then I, I think, wow, what was I doing? <laughs> well, practice makes perfect, so I'm yes. sure, I'm sure. Anna, were there any specific other hardships then that you encountered while learning Pansori? I wonder whether language-wise, were there things that, did you need to learn Korean in depth, uh, more intensely in order for you to prepare for Pansori? Were there any other barriers that you believe you came across? Well, I think, I mean, obviously, because I was learning Pansuri for my research, I'm an ethnomusicologist, and that means that while I'm researching music, I need to be able to learn to perform the music myself in order to really have an academic understanding of the music as well. So knowing that before I came to Korea with the express purpose of doing research and learning Pansuri as part of that, I was uh, learning the language in advance. And so I was buying books from pan about Pansuri, like learning the specific vocabulary and stuff. Um, but then, yeah, obviously you, you do the work, you, you focus a lot on that pronunciation aspect. Um, I think that's probably the main thing, things like the sort of double consonants in Korean pronunciation takes a bit more work um, than um, other things. And then things like dialect, dialect you need to have the Cholladu uh, kind of dialect going That's what as I was well. thinking, right? Yeah. You need to have a great, great understanding of the dialect here in Korea as well in order to put on a, a good performance. Um, I understand now that in the course of writing your dissertation, you interviewed, and do correct me if I'm wrong, 60 Pansori performers mm -hmm. and attended 90 performances. What was your greatest takeaway from that experience? Well, I mean, it was fascinating. Uh, first of all, it's just fun because obviously Pansori singers are uh, storytellers. And so when you just let them go in an interview, they tell the most wonderful stories. I think the, my shortest interview was an hour and a half going into four hours long because there's just so many fun stories to listen to. Uh, it's, you know, pain to organize later. But um, I think the main thing is what's just so fascinating for me is it's not an easy path. I mean, we were talking about the hardships of learning just now. Even once you have learned to a certain extent and you're trying to support yourself as an artist, it's really tough. And that passion that the people People. And it's not just, you know, the young people obviously doing lots of fun experiments these days, but the master singers have been doing so much work in order to perfect Pansori as an art form. And I think that's just so impressive to look at and really sort of feel that passion while you're talking to them. I think that was probably my greatest takeaway from these interviews. Yes. And was it during that experience where you came across your uh, teacher, the master performer, is it? Yes. Here's home. Could you tell us a bit about her? Yes, yeah, so um, I met her in my usual kind of research way was that I would go to a performance and then afterwards I'd stand sort of outside their dressing room and when they came out it's like, hi, I'm doing research, can I interview you? And I did the same thing with her and then I went to um, interview her and it was just around the corner from my house. She was like, oh, you know, I heard that you might be needing someone to teach you. Um, would you want to learn from me? I was like, oh, yes, please. And then she grabbed her drum, sat me down. I was like, right, you're starting to learn now, um, which was just amazing. So, I mean, I started learning straight away. We did the actual interview like three years later. We never did it then. But just that openness, that warmth and that willingness to teach me and demand proper things. None of this like, oh, you're a foreigner, I'll go easy on you, which I think for me was incredibly helpful, obviously, both as a researcher and as a learner as well. Right, of course. Meanwhile, Kaya, you are part of a Samul Nori group that includes all foreign me members based here in South Korea. Could you tell us a bit about how the group was formed? Um, <clears throat> so, actually, the group was formed shortly before I joined. So, I joined in 2013. Uh, and at that time, prior to that, there had been a foreign Samul Nori team connected to the Kugakwon. So, that was where I first took my introduction to Janggu class. And in the past, they had the beginner's Janggu class. And then for students who were interested in playing more, they had a Samunori class with a team. And many of the members were incredibly talented and had been playing and learning for quite a long time. But that class and program was discontinued. So some of the members wanted to continue playing. And one woman, Hendrike Lange, she started to reach out to some of those members and asked, oh, would you like to make another group, Expat Samonori? So that group was formed, and then I joined as well. And I think that group, we currently aim to provide a sort of stepping stone or intermediate area for the people who have enjoyed learning as a beginner, and they want to continue to enhance and 
perform and play more because there's an abundance of sort of introduction and experience classes available, but there's not a lot after that. So many performers who get a taste and think, wow, this is really fun, I really want to continue, but they have trouble finding a way to continue. And I think partially that's due to the language barrier. For a Korean who gets that taste and wants to continue, they can more easily search out and join their local teams or other groups in Korean. But some foreign residents who haven't developed their language skills enough yet might feel very shy or awkward. So our team wants to provide sort of a fun and accessible way for people to enjoy that as a hobby. Right, I see. How many members are there in your group right now? We currently have about 10 members. 10 members. Yeah, but yeah, everyone, no one is in Korea as a full-time musician. So we are all some workers, some students, some housewives. Yeah, everyone is just has their their sort of professional main, lives. Yeah, professional lives, and then we all just come together to enjoy this passion that hobby. you have for samulnori. Yeah. I see. How often do you meet to practice? So we meet once a week, and we practice for about three or four hours. But of course, we practice. And then we have a snack, and then we chat, and then we practice. So. Well, that's all part of the experience, I'd say. Yes. And in recent times, interest in traditional Korean music has been growing, especially among the young here. Mostly thanks to this local pansori pop band called Inalchi, which includes four graduates from your prestigious university. How do you respond to such initiatives to blend pop music and uh, traditional Korean music together? I think it's quite interesting if you look at the sort of the, the, the history of Korean traditional music, what kind of things have been happening. If you go back just a couple of generations, it was very much considered unacceptable to do these kind of popularization activities. You know, the art should remain pure. And I think, you know, obviously the traditional art forms need to continue to be protected. If you lose that, you lose the roots and everything is going to be gone. But you can definitely see how through the efforts of many, many people, there's much more openness now to experimentation. And it's once you've got this kind of atmosphere that allows for that, that you're then going to get these entertaining and impactful uh, moments like Inachi's performances. So I think from that perspective, I view it very positively. What I do always worry about a little bit is on the one hand, you know, if only that then becomes seen as the tradition, you lose that perspective of where the traditions come from. You need that basis to make good things. And the other thing is just thinking in terms of promotion activities. I'd hope that uh, things like Inachi and other uh, traditional Korean music performances don't get bunched in with popular music. There are ways that um, by promoting it in that way, it's not quite suitable for the genre. So thinking a little bit more about promotion strategies as well that are more suitable for the genre. I think that's an area that we'll still need to work on a lot in the future as well. Right, and speaking about that, Kaya, personally, what do you perhaps suggest to perhaps boost greater interest in Korean traditional music among the young here? Um, I, think, I think Korea is doing a fairly good job. Yeah, it seems that, as, as you mentioned, with Inalchi and some of those um, sort of fusion or pop-inspired performances, that the popular culture, especially K-pop, has recently been making an effort to include some either visual references to Korean traditional instruments or references in the song. They mention the instrument's names or some of the rhythms. And I think that has been effective because, especially for the foreign audiences, if they listen to the song or they, they watch a music video and they see oh, this interesting performance or instrument, or they hear the name and they might research, oh, what is this? So I think that has been very effective in kind of spreading awareness of what the music or the sounds could be. Yeah. But as Anna mentioned, I, I agree that it's a little bit challenging to, to keep both the roots and develop further. So I, I also agree, because Samulnori itself was a development from the traditional pungmul. So I believe, yeah, it is important to keep, 
pay attention to all of the elements and right. not only focus on the more recent. Yeah, it's a tough task. It's yeah. a tough task to say the least. Now, Anna, speaking within your capacity as a professor of uh, traditional music at one of the most prestigious universities here in Korea, what academic and, of course, other support mechanisms do you propose to better preserve Pansori, if I may? Well, I mean, I think the most, the number one most important thing is um, this you can only preserve something also if people are aware and engaged and so I think a lot of efforts are already being made I mean just specifically for Pansori you've got the Korea Pansori Preservation Association the World Pansori Association in places like France you have the KVOX festival which promotes Pansori as well and this is where you also won first prize was it yes that is yes exactly <laughs> I won first prize in their foreigner competition uh, but it's things like that it's they open spaces to enjoy pansori without burden. I think it's getting away from that fear of kugak is old, it's difficult, you know. Once you get away from that fear, there's actually a lot of fun that you can find. Most people, once they get the chance to encounter it, they then want to find out more. I think what Gaia was saying just now with that, moving on to the next step is hugely important. There's a lot of people that come, they're interested, and then they want to learn more and there's nothing for them to do there necessarily. So I think that uh, people like Gaia doing a very important role. I mean, I try and do things like that as well. I uh, try and network my students to, if they want to learn more, you know, you can talk to this person, that person. We have exchange programs with our mu music students. So they learn English and they teach their students their majors, these kind of things. Um, as a practitioner as well, um, people obviously find it interesting when they see foreigners performing pansuri. And so I try and, you know, put myself out there in that way, although I'm by no means professional, but we try. So um, like this Saturday um, as well at the Namsan Kugakdang, um, myself together with some of my fellow foreign students and our teacher, we're performing 3 p.m. Um, if anyone wants to come along, that would be great. We're just wanting to show how much we have fun. And if that can inspire other people to have fun and want to learn more, then I think that would be wonderful. Right, so that is this Saturday for those who have yet to make weekend plans. This Saturday, 3 p.m., is it? At the Yansan yes. Kugagwan. Thank right. you. Right. Akaya, do share with us some of your group's performance plans for this year. Ah, uh, well, unfortunately, unlike Anna, we do not have an imminent performance that <laughs> I can invite you all to. But we hope that now that the COVID situation has calmed down. Unfortunately, over the past few years, there haven't been that many festivals or competitions that we could prepare and enjoy performing at. But we are really hoping that this year, our team can join some competitions and both because those are inspirational and in that we get a lot of energy when we're preparing for a performance but also just being in that environment and seeing all the other amazing teams and performances gives us a lot of excitement and energy. Right, and speaking as a lay person, do you suppose there are enough performances or such opportunities for Samuel Nori players to partake in in the country? Or do uh, they need to be more? I mean, for those who are foreigners like yourself. Uh, I think for foreigners, it's quite difficult to access. Yeah, either because of the language or because the, the network exists, but some foreign performers don't know how to access or connect with the network in a meaningful way that will allow them those opportunities. I see. Yeah. Hopefully those in the industry are listening to you right now and changes <laughs> will be made in the near future. All right, Kai, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts. And Anna, Professor Yates Liu, of course, thank you so much. And hopefully people will be there to join you on Saturday. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> well, that is all the time we have today. Thank you for watching. Do join us tomorrow, that is Thursday, for a look at the global smartphone market.